this week on the Back Table Podcast. Some people want to address certain aspects of their journey first. Other people want to address their voice first. I've heard some people say, I'm not going to do anything else until I work on my voice because that's the most important thing to me. And other people are not in that place. So I think it's really meeting the person where they are and when they're ready to do it. And a lot of people have opinions about it. And I think really it's about what the person wants and exploring that from what their goals are, what's going to make them feel good about their voice from inside and what is going to support them in having people identify them for who they are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Back Table ENT Podcast. Our goal is to bring you the best and brightest from our field of otolaryngology. We hope that you can take something from our show and apply it to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric ENT. Today, we will be discussing the very important topic on gender-affirming voice. My guests are two highly experienced and skilled professionals in laryngology, Sarah Snyder, speech and language pathologist, and Dr. Mark Curry. Sarah Schneider is a speech and language pathologist and fellow of the American Speech and Hearing Association, practicing at the University of California, San Francisco since 2007. Sarah is the co-director of the UCSF Voice and Swallowing Center and the associate clinical professor in the Department of Otolaryngology. She specializes in topics across voice and upper airway, specifically gender-affirming voice and care of the professional and performing voice, topics on which she speaks both nationally and internationally. Sarah also serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Voice. Dr. Mark Curry is Professor and Vice Chair of Quality for the Department of Otolaryngology at Mount Sinai Health System. He is Chief of Laryngology and is the Director of the Grab Scheid Voice and Swallowing Center at Mount Sinai. He has had decades of experience in caring for vocal performers across the United States, making significant contributions to the management of professional voice care, and he's also been a trailblazer for gender-affirming voice care. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Super happy to be here. So we have California and New York City. So this is very exciting that we have a kind of um, across the U.S. I'm very excited. Can you guys first tell us a little bit about yourselves um, and your practices? Sarah, do you want to start? Sure. Well, you have not totally aged me because you didn't say when I started doing this. And I won't age myself either. But I've been doing this for a long time. I was thinking back to both Mark and I were doing gender affirming care before it was sort of as mainstream as it is now, and it's been a large part of my practice throughout my career. And yeah, so I think uh, this is super important to me to continue to educate and connect with other colleagues so that we can continue to provide not only gender-affirming care in the area of voice, but really gender-affirming care across all aspects of healthcare. We never know we're going to meet a trans person or a gender non-conforming person. And so this idea of creating gender um, safe space in all aspects of healthcare is super important. So I first met Sarah when we were both in Vanderbilt. I won't give the year. Uh, she was doing her CFY and uh, I was the medical director of the Vanderbilt Voice Center at the time. And uh, in 2004, I, um, I took a job at UCSF as the director of laryngology, at the division of laryngology there. And I recruited Sarah to come out and helped me build the center. And then for mostly personal reasons, I moved on to Mount Sinai Health System. I'm in my in-laws basement and they are aging and it was nice for us to get back east. But I've been doing, you know, Maddie Deutsch started the transgender center at UCSF in, I think the year was about 2010 or so. And I just never saw somebody come in with such fire and get something done so quickly within the UCSF system. Before that, I'd had a few experiences with transgender women um, complaining of some vocal issues. These were several women, and they had all been trans for decades before they saw me. Complaints were mostly of vocal fatigue and instability. And I didn't understand what transgender was at that time. And then uh, Maddie, uh, Dr. Deutsch, comes in and starts the center and began to be a passion trying to figure out how to help women, because that's primarily who we treat. 
trans men seem to get a significant uh, benefit from testosterone alone. So we see a much smaller number. And um, really to help them obtain a congruent voice with what they desire is the goal. So voice and style of communication all go together. It's great that um, the UCSF system was supportive and was able to provide the resources to build a true compassionate and holistic like gender affirming voice center, um, especially as far back as 2010. So that's that's really wonderful. You mentioned several things, including, you know, terminology as well as decades, you know, being where people might be in transition. And we're going to hit some of those clinical points. But before we get into it, I think it would be good to get into some of the terminology just to give a brief overview. You know, when patients or people ask, um, you know, what is the difference between sex and gender? And some people will confuse that and also talk about sexuality. Can we just go into some of the, the terms? I think sexuality has to do with physical characteristics and traits, um, and people are generally assigned a sex at birth based on the appearance of their genitals. And that is not the same as gender identity. And gender identity is uh, the person, how they identify their gender and what they feel most congruent with in terms of gender. And there's a gender spectrum. And Historically, it has been a binary spectrum of male and female, and really there is a spectrum that is not binary, um, and that includes multiple different genders or a gender. And so to go on that concept, sex, the physical characteristic, is determined at birth, right, by what's born, but gender identity really develops by about age five, right? And so... Our children are figuring out if they have characteristics more masculine or feminine. And nowadays, we have the ability to help somebody change in transition if they really feel safer, healthier in a gender uh, that isn't congruent with their birth sex organs and characteristics. So... And society's accepting of the fact that nothing is really binary. You know, good, bad. There's a spectrum. Male, female. There's a spectrum, right? And so everything is gray. And, you know, it took me a long time to wrap my head around that. The older we get, the grayer things are. And the easier. Well, everywhere. That's true. <laughs> Multiple levels. And it's also easier to accept that you're not right. It's just your opinion. You know, it's just our opinion. And so we can say what we want. It's our opinion and it's congruent for us, but it's not right or wrong. And uh, that has been a healthy concept to learn. And a lot of people, I think, can confuse sexuality with gender identity as well um, in terms of who you're attracted to. And that, that can be an exploration as well. And so you're right, it's our opinion, it's who we are and the choices and kind of our desires and gender, our identities can be very innate. Let's talk about, you know, when patients come in in terms of patient pronouns, you know, whether you're in the gender affirming voice clinic or whether you're the general ENT in your community, how do you approach pronouns in clinic? So our front desk is required to ask when the patient comes in, it's already specified in their chart. And if there's any questions, I clarify it. I don't typically announce my pronouns when I walk into the room because I feel like I look male and I use the he, him pronouns. But if the person is feeling uncomfortable, then to let them know that I understand that not everything on the outside looks the same as it is on the inside, I will announce my pronouns in the room. But it's, it's not my habit. I accept appearance doesn't mask the pronouns often that they desire, right? But how do you handle it, Sarah? Well, I think it's been an evolution over time in the context of the medical system. It depends on, you know, patient registration and how the clinical team has been educated, right? And what the different resources are. So I think this has evolved over time. And now as part of our registration for every single patient in the UCSF system, everybody has asked their pronouns. 
So this is not just someone sort of deciding, I'm going to ask this person their pronouns, but I'm not going to ask this person their pronouns. So everybody gets asked as standard practice, um, no matter what clinic is it in. And then that's actually placed right next to the um, lived name. A uh, chosen name comes up first, and then underneath it is the legal name, if that's different, and then pronouns. So it's really, that has been an evolution in our system, and I recognize everybody doesn't have access to that. But there are ways in different clinics that you can do that. The other thing we have done, like uh, Mark was saying, is confirming people's pronouns when they're checking in. And then we do, it depends on the person in clinic. People have different practice patterns. But we often, it would be like, my name's Sarah Schneider. I'm one of the speech pathologists. I'm going to be helping take care of you today. My pronouns are she, her. And then leaving it at that. And then if the person wants to offer theirs, great. If they don't, then I confirm and so just giving an opportunity to have that inclusiveness and hopefully demonstrating safety. Have you found yourselves a mistake, a pronoun? And if so, what is the best way to, to correct yourself? I typically apologize when it happens. If I slip, I just say, I'm sorry, I used the wrong pronoun. Please forgive me. And there's no intent. And I don't really think it's a microaggression you know, sometimes I call a cis woman by the wrong pronoun, too. That happens. And sometimes I call a cis man by the wrong pronoun. So I think it happens with a little more frequency in the transgender, but I wouldn't say more than once every other month or even just a couple times a year. You know, you do become acutely aware of it. It is on the banner in the electronic medical record. So you have the chart open. You're watching, you're looking at it. It's right there for us. We have that privilege. And, you know, the, the difficult time is when somebody's style of communication is so incongruent with a stereotypical assigned type of uh, gender communication. That's when I find myself confusing. If they are very aggressive in their speaking patterns, Sarah, I don't know your thoughts. That's when I find that I may slip. Yeah, I think it's contextual sometimes, too, when, you know, depending on is this a patient that you're sitting in front of? Is it a colleague that you're sitting in front of? Is it a friend that you're sitting in front of? Right. And misgendering can happen in any of those contexts. And I do agree with Mark. It's sort of like acknowledge the mistake, apologize, move on, even if we, we need to sit in our own discomfort for making the mistake versus um, having the person that we misgendered bear the burden of our mistake by continuing to talk about it, right? And that might be, if we feel bad, that might be our tendency. And so um, I think that's an important piece. And like Mark was saying, when you have the banner in front of you, when you're on in a visit, it might be different than when you are more casual in a different situation. So I think it's imperative that we're all practicing that and how we may have, you know, with intersectionality and all of the different experiences we have in our lives, people have different experiences and recognizing that is important. Those are great points. And I think that those pearls of, hey, acknowledging, apologizing, being able to move forward and then connecting on that sort of provider patient, you know, what they're here for and really caring is very important because um, otherwise it's like, well, I just, I don't know. And what if I say this? And then how do I get out? You know, you kind of go in with this sort of assumption, self-consciousness, and that's not, that's not beneficial <laughs> to anybody. So tell us a little bit about transitioning and where voice plays a role in the journey. How is this part of the transition? I've had a patient say to me, my voice is my second face. And I've had a good percentage of trans women shift to non-binary pronouns because they don't feel comfortable announcing their gender if their style of communication or appearance is incongruent. So I like to start with the patient as soon as possible. I think that all we're doing primarily at the beginning is talking about what does a listener use to gender the speaker that they're listening to? What are the characteristics of communication that are considered stereotypically masculine and stereotypically feminine? And then I always say to the patient, and where do you want to be on that? The goal is to get you comfortable with your voice and communication. Doesn't mean you have to be 
stereotypically one or the other. The second face issue, so as soon as possible. Now, Thursday, I was doing surgery on a woman, and she was told by her general surgeon, oh, don't have your voice surgery before your vaginal plasty, or we'll ruin it. Because of intubation? Yeah, but they don't have to. I totally agree. They just need to be intubated with a 6-0 tube in a grade one view, which means you're looking directly at the vocal folds and you're using an appropriate size tube for the patient. So, but it was her desire to postpone it. So I just did her thyroid cartilage reduction and she'll work on her voice behaviorally and then possibly come back for surgery. I think it's any time. Like some people want to address certain aspects of their journey first. Other people want to address their voice first. I've heard some people say, I'm not going to do anything else until I work on my voice because that's the most important thing to me. And other people are not in that place. So to Mark's point, I think it's really meeting the person where they are and when they're ready to do it. And a lot of people have opinions about it, as we heard. And I think really it's about what the person wants and exploring that from what their goals are, what's going to make them feel good about their voice from inside, and what is going to support them in having people identify them for who they are. I can just add one thing to that before we go on to a different point. Financially, hospitals make money from inpatient procedures, and voice care, even voice surgery, is outpatient. It's all outpatient. So our transgender centers, as well-meaning as they are, you know, have to survive. And I just, I do feel that even our endocrinology colleagues, what we can do for voice still is not well-known, right? And oftentimes it's addressed last only because it's been ignored because of the financial situation of, you know, how do we support the clinic? How do we support the clinicians? That's why I, I, education about it is what I said, as soon as the patient decides and then let them come back when they're ready for change. Tell me the centers who are part of the multidisciplinary teams for um, gender affirming care at your institutions. Oh, there's so many people. Uh, So we have our interdisciplinary laryngology uh, team of speech pathologists and a laryngologist and multiple laryngologists. Then we have, you know, primary care, endocrine, mental health, social work, plastics. We have a trans care coordinator, which is amazing because we can get this person tied in and they can help, like, understand the person's goals and get them directed to the places um, or if they're having any issues with access and insurance and those types of things. Who am I missing? So general surgery, urologic surgery, and GYN surgery, um, they all do some different phases of transgender surgical interventions. And you're right, the transgender center is a multidisciplinary clinic. And the difference is multidisciplinary means they inter-refer, right? But they don't see the patient same time. I've always loved seeing the patient in an interdisciplinary model, which means I see the patient with my colleagues in the different disciplines in the same time, same clinic space. I think it allows better communication. It facilitates communication and, you know, communications professionalism and nobody leaves the room with, or it's less likely that people will be on different pages. We come up with a plan for the patient based on what the patient wants at the center And then we talk about what we can do when. Who's the quarterback, sort of, of the (laughs) overall management? And does that depend on age and stage, or how does that how does that go? I mean, in our I left this out. We have our adolescent gender affirming center too, so we're seeing people across this age spectrum. Quarterback. Usually, I would say we are not the quarterbacks. Um, We are we are a, a cog in the wheel of how things are working together. I would say that primary care or in some cases endocrine maybe is the quarterback. Mark, do you agree with that? Yeah, but I think specifically for the voice, you know, some surgeons mistakenly feel like they have to be quarterback. I'm not that way, I hope. We come to a shared decision. If anybody's the quarterback, it's the patient because he or she is going to tell us what they want when they want it. I only tell them what I can do. 
and my SLP colleagues the same. And I am a firm believer that, and my first manuscripts we published on this is surgery is an adjunct to behavioral therapy for the transgender patient. And, you know, I can elevate pitch with surgery, but if the patient doesn't shift their style of communication, pitch is not the only determinant of the gender of the speaker. So it's my goal to have the patients aware of that so that they can make choices. That's a good lead into, um, you mentioned characteristics of communication. Is that kind of related to pitch and shift? Can you kind of explain what exactly that means? There's lots of variables of communication. And so we kind of talk about those variables. They're like dials that we can shift. And so we're, we're working on pitch is one of them. And often people come in focused on pitch because it's a very it's a very easy one to say, I want a higher pitched voice, right? Or I want a lower pitched voice, or I want something that people turn around and they don't know like what my gender is, you know? So pitch is an, is an easy one to kind of pick out. But then there's resonance or where the energy of the voice is where we feel that. Could be forward, it could be throaty, it could be chesty, as people say. There's intonation or inflection, how we're moving up and down. There's volume. Sometimes, you know, people may characterize in more masculine communication, you're using more volume for emphasis. And in more feminine communication, you're using more pitch for emphasis. That, again, is a spectrum. You know, we hear cis men and cis women talk in different patterns. So this is really when we talk about characteristics, there is a lot of fluidity in it. But there are definitely, as Mark referenced earlier, stereotypical characteristics. So those are a few things. There's articulation, rate of speech. We could dig into, you know, social pragmatic sorts of things. So there's a lot to talk about in that context. And so I agree that pitch is just one thing that genders the speaker. If you can't see the speaker, it can be one of the main things, but brightness and formant frequency. So brightness in terms of more spectral moments and tertosis, cuteness, it is a really important characteristic. Which is part of resonance. It is part of resonance, is yeah. weighty. A female voice is less weighty, and the harmonic spectrum, because it starts at a higher fundamental, isn't as thick, isn't as rich. You know, when you start higher on the fundamental, your first uh, harmonic is higher, and you shift all of your spectral moments and your formant frequencies up slightly. So I think if some of the AI programs that judge femininity of voice, the one Yael has helped mm -hmm. create, really works more on formant frequency analysis. So if we're talking about more feminine communication, if we can bring resonance forward, so I can kind of talk in the back of my throat, or I can bring it forward. I'm not I'm changing the pitch a little bit, but I'm not changing the pitch a lot. But what we feel, we feel more energy here. And this forward feeling amplifies those upper harmonics that Mark was referencing. And it, even if the pitch is not a lot higher, it makes the pitch sound higher. People perceive it as higher. So that's why resonance in these spectral moments, all of those things are so important. And there's been some work saying that uh, feminine voice has different relationships of the formants of the of the energy spectra than male voices. Specifically, the second energy spectra, the second formant, is proportionately higher in a feminine voice. And so, you know, people can learn to to sort of smile on the inside by raising and flattening the back of their tongue, bringing it up to the their posterior maxillary molar teeth when they do it. I, when I'm doing it now, it still sounds masculine, I think. But if I, this is a darker voice when I stop doing it, right? Mark was a speech pathologist in his former life. <laughs> I did not know that. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> no, so it, 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 it's different. And, and if you've noticed in your voices, I mean, intensity. Sarah had about three different pitches in that every syllable was a different pitch. In a masculine speaking pattern, every syllable is the same pitch, intensity, right? So those are the types of cues that the listener uses more than absolute pitch. Because we've all heard low-pitched women who sound perfectly feminine. 
Now, you know, an alto, a woman who's an alto and grows up as an alto is used to being misgendered on the telephone because the telephone doesn't transmit all of the frequencies of the spectral portions of speech. It cuts the lower ones and the higher ones out. So low-pitched voices on the phone are all we really have, or the pitch of the voice on the phone is one of the few characteristics we have. You know, a cis woman who's an alto is used to it. A cis woman whose pitch drops as she ages is usually very upset when she's addressed with the wrong pronouns over the telephone, right? And I can understand why someone who is transitioning would have the same sorts of issues, fears, and concerns, right? When you see a patient in your clinic, do you have um, a specific questionnaire for your transgender patients? Or what are some of the key questions in your history when you're talking to these patients? What are the differences when it's a trans uh, woman or a trans man? There are definitely um, different patient reported outcome measures that we use. There's like the trans woman voice questionnaire. There is something called the gender congruent scale. There is something called the VENI, which is uh, for gender nonconforming non-binary people. There is a trans masculine voice questionnaire that is that we tend not to use because it's not as well validated. But there are various patient reported outcome measures that we use and track to really try to measure outcomes. And then from a history perspective, we ask questions related to the things we need to know for their voice care. So we want to know where they are in their journey so that we understand how voice fits in for them. We want to know if they're on hormones or not. Again, because for trans women, the hormones are not going to affect their voice, but for trans men, it absolutely will. And so we want to understand these various aspects so that we can understand where what the trajectory for this person may be. We also want to understand their vocal demand, just like anybody that comes in related to their voice. We want to understand vocal demand, what they need their voice to do in various aspects of their life. Mark, what else do you ask? So I ask about effort to produce voice, vocal fatigue, and I ask, about, you know, are you expressing yourself full-time in this gender? Or are there still periods where you're using your birth gender, so you're shifting your voice? Because it's very difficult for most patients to sustain change if they're in a situation where they're masculine at some point and feminine at another. But that doesn't mean we can't start with education and trying. Yeah, code switching just gives us a maybe a trajectory. Maybe it's going to be a little bit harder for them to be as consistent because of that code switching. It might take a little bit longer for them to get to the place where they want to be. Do you also ask about what have they done to try to shift their voice? Yeah, we do ask, what, what have you done already? Often we get nothing. Often we get, I've watched YouTube videos, but I can't make sense out of it. Or I've watched YouTube videos and I'm happy with the way it sounds and I can't maintain it, you know, or I've done a course online with so-and-so. I mean, there are several people out there who have courses, who have tutorials online about how to transition your voice. How do you feel about the online courses? Because, you know, obviously um, in many states right now, access to gender-affirming care is very difficult, even for adults. What are your thoughts on the online courses? Um, Because that's something that is accessible for some people. Totally. I think we're, I would say we are biased. We see the people that it doesn't work for. So I think that's the first piece of it, just to acknowledge that. So in my practice, in our practice at UCSF, I think there are certain techniques that lead to fatigue and discomfort and are are not, I would say, the most efficient uh, way to achieve the changes. But again, recognizing that we see the people it doesn't work for. And that, that's it. I think Sarah and I um, grew up in the same similar schooling and that vocal efficiency for speech in voice production is the most important thing. And when patients try to modify pitch too soon, often and or formant frequencies, often they do it in an inefficient manner. And there are courses out there that stress pitch. There are courses out there that stress formant or brightness, formant frequencies. 
So it's really talking to the patient about what they've done and the course. And, and there are, you know, good courses. I just find that often, I know you have to give the patient a hook. You have to get them in. And most patients just want a higher pitched voice. But programs that start with too much pitch elevation often result in a lot of strain. Yeah. And I think it depends how you introduce it too. Um, like from an efficiency standpoint, it's going to be much easier to change pitch if you pair it with resonance and airflow. And so if you can do it in a way where, and this is, this is true across performing voice, this is true in, in all aspects of how the mechanism works. So if we pair airflow, resonance, and pitch together, which often um, some programs separate them and they'll say, well, we're going to work on this at this time, or we're going to work on this at this time. I tend to put them together, and I think that really helps to minimize fatigue, minimize excessive strain, those types of things, so that we can have the hook, the experience of changing the pitch, recognizing that we might have to play around with it, and this voice that we're achieving today is not the final voice, right? Yeah. Well, and it makes sense. I mean, you know, it sounds like everybody's voice to begin with and the stage that they're at is going to be different. So sort of the dial analogy that we used in the beginning in terms of what, how much do we need to tweak what for each person is going to be different. So I, I'm glad that you guys brought that up. The, the caveat I have with this is that, you know, the untrained or uncoordinated vocalist often ends up increasing tension unintendedly when they elevate pitch, right? You know, the pitch is supposed to be just the front muscle of the larynx, the cricothyroid muscle contracting, right? And you're supposed to leave everything else alone. But if you contract the cricothyroid muscle, you have to slowly add tension to the TALCA complex. Otherwise, the vocal folds get pulled apart and phonation stops. And so this is what the person is doing when they elevate pitch. And it's a very difficult thing. And it's how performers get themselves into trouble, right, Sarah? They don't let the voice shift at the appropriate register transition. And so they add too much tension. So if a, a non-performer is going for pitch elevation, they have to start with resonance and flow, and then they have to maintain resonance and flow because often they elevate pitch and brightness by sort of using a hyperfunctional underclosure strain pattern. That's where they can get stuck just like our performers, right? They get stuck in that strain to elevate pitch with TA tension, vocalis muscle tension, and not primarily cricothyroid tension. So when the patient comes in and, you know, you've done your history, you know, what's important on the physical exam? Um, and we can then also go into scopes and strobes and things like that. So if I can start, I feel the position of the larynx in the neck where it's maintained and the amount of tension around it and the, the, the strap muscles over the top of it and tongue are really important. It tells me what the patient's doing. I mean, I can move my strap muscles around and it changes my voice a little but not dramatically. I can push on the base of my tongue. And when you can't do that with a patient because they're so tense, because they're holding everything rigid, that becomes, you know, the challenge. Laryngeal, paralaryngeal relaxation, tongue relaxation, tongue stretching. So to me, that's one of the most important things. Most of our patients come to us with a normal laryngeal exam, right? I mean, sometimes you see mid-third fullness or thickening from somebody who's very boisterous, there's always slight laryngeal asymmetry that's good to know about. You know, most laryngeas are not perfectly symmetric. So we look for that, but how is the patient using their voice? And are they efficient and not using extra laryngeal muscles tension to produce voice? Well, Mark, when you said, can I start? I wrote down, because I didn't want to forget what I was going to say, as I wrote down perilaryngeal palpation. <laughs> So we're on the exact we're on the exact same page. I think that is a really important piece of the physical exam, um, as Mark already described. So I won't go into detail on that, but I will comment on we did a study where we looked back at about a hundred patients, and only about five percent 
of our people seeking gender affirming care had findings, abnormal findings on the laryngeal exam. We did not include superglottic hyperfunction or any of that sort of thing as an abnormal finding. Just this was vocal fold findings. And I think in that, that's a small number of people that have abnormal vocal fold findings. But it also, I think that laryngeal exam is super important to see how the vocal folds are vibrating, how they're closing, how somebody is navigating their voice as they change pitch, higher, lower, whatever it might be, because it gives us um, guidance on how they're using their voice and what it's not the be all end all, but what they might be capable of, or at least how they're navigating it now. So I think that piece is really important. I think it is also debated in the community whether there needs to be laryngeal exam. And I think it depends on access for the patient. This should not be a barrier to their care, but I think it augments their care and helps us um, ensure safety as we are treating patients. Sarah, what do you mean it's debated whether patients need a laryngeal exam? Yeah, some people will um, say that because to destigmatize and non medicalize care for people seeking gender affirming care, people will debate whether the laryngeal exam is needed because this person doesn't have a voice disorder. And so should their larynx be looked at because they don't have a voice disorder? And I agree, like they don't have a voice disorder, but they are seeking care for their voice um, in a way where we're manipulating pitch, we're manipulating resonance, we're doing a lot of these things that from a safety and health perspective, I think it is it is important. So the the exam... The laryngeal exam is a physiologic thing. You know, people think of endoscopy as you look and you see what's there. When a speech pathologist interested in voice does a laryngeal exam, he or she, and the same with the surgeon, is not looking to see structure. They're really looking to see function, right? So it's important how much supraglottal tension is there because it's going to inform our choices of intervention. So if somebody had a, a, a heart murmur, you'd get an EKG before you started treating it, right? If somebody complained of hearing changes, you'd get an audiogram to see the function before you started treating it. And if someone wants to change their voice... A complete laryngeal examination is going to help inform us on how we can help them change it. So I agree, it shouldn't be a barrier to care. And, you know, some people think that it is, and they think it drives up the cost of medicine. But in other areas of medicine, we can show that the cost of care for an episode of dysphonia is reduced significantly based on how soon the patient had a complete laryngeal examination and all we could do from the insurance database was look for strobe. So if a patient complained of hoarseness and their strobe was within three months of their initial complaint, that episode cost of care was less than if their strobe was after three months because they sat around for those three months or six months or whatever and did CT scans, took proton pump inhibitors, and didn't get the type of intervention they needed. So it's important we're considering all of these aspects, right? Because we don't want somebody who doesn't have insurance or can't afford care to not receive any gender-affirming services. So it really is about navigating this in the way that we can that's best for the person seeking care and within their means. And I think one other argument I'm going to add to this is that I believe that all gender affirming services should be covered by insurance. We need to ensure that we're providing the highest quality of care and that we're making sure that we cover all of our bases in that context. And I think this is one piece that continues to support that. Like this is this is a need for this person population. And we want to make sure that that we're supporting all of that in the decisions that we're making. I'm glad you said that, Sarah, because insurance is access to care. Just to, to be clear that I think this laryngeal exam informs my decisions and actions, even if it's healthy. And the reason is because I'm looking at function, not just appearance. Yeah. And Sarah, you agree. 
Totally agree. Yes. 100%. And that's why I was saying that 5% might say like, oh, people don't really need an exam. We can do it later. But I believe there's all of these other things we're looking at, which are important. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's difficult, though, because often clinicians who don't have access to laryngeal examination techniques tell their patients it's a barrier to care. You don't need it. And if the patient can get it, I do think it informs care. It informs clinical decision-making. So for the reasons I mentioned about the audiogram and the EKG. So when you are looking at a strobe, you're looking at function. Explain what that means. So that's how well the vocal folds vibrate to closure and how the person is managing the laryngeal posture as they're changing loudness levels and pitch levels and how efficiently the larynx closes in terms of not just closure during vibration, but, you know, is there, are they doing something funny with the arytenoid position subtly to alter the, the timbre or the intensity or the pitch of their phonation? And so those are the sorts of things I'm looking for. If they have trouble with elongation of the vocal folds as they're changing pitch, that's going to help us understand maybe what we need to work on from a muscular imbalance perspective. And I like using a rigid scope because I hold the patient's tongue and I, it helps me determine how well they can separate tongue function for relaxation from laryngeal function for voice production. Because the tongue's going to help shift resonance where laryngeal positioning and vocal fold lengthening or shortening is going to help change pitch. And they have to be able to separate them to tolerate the rigid scope. And so it tells me something and it allows you to assess how coordinated the patient is too. If they can't do it initially, how quickly can I get them into that pattern? And how is the exam different for an individual that's male assigned at birth versus um, an individual that's female assigned at birth? Are there differences in some of that or is it the same? You had mentioned that with um, hormone therapy, there may be changes, I think, with transgender males' voice. Can we go into some of those function and anatomical points? So, you know, the laryngeal size and pharyngeal size occur because of exposure to androgens during puberty, right? So testosterone is a much more potent anabolic steroid than estrogen, and that causes the male vocal tract to enlarge. And the female vocal tract doesn't enlarge as much. So in general, female vocal folds are vocal folds not exposed to testosterone during puberty stay shorter, about 25% shorter. The volume of the larynx is 25 or 30% less, and it's the same with the pharynx. Pharyngeal volume is significantly less if the pharynx is not exposed to testosterone during puberty. However, androgen therapy for a trans man, usually 100 milligrams a week injected after six months, will cause the mucosa, the skin of the vocal folds, to thicken. And the cartilaginous structures and the overall size don't change, but because the skin thickens, the pitch drops. Are you aware, Gopi, I'm going to ask a question. If adolescents, depending on their exposure to biologic puberty or um, HRT-induced puberty, is there a change in cartilaginous structures? Because I think there might be. So if you place a trans woman on Lupron, on, on a puberty blockers, on hormone blockers, she will not develop secondary sex characteristics of a larger larynx and pharynx, right? But her long bone epiphyses won't seal, so she'll become tall. So you'll end up with a tall, thin woman, which, okay. So I think once puberty has occurred, there may be subtle cartilaginous changes with the addition of testosterone. You know, there might be subtle changes with the removal of testosterone through castration, but it's generally not considered the major pitch driver, right? Oh, yeah. Agreed. I just wanted to add that piece in. Yeah, yeah I, I think there is too, but it's primarily that the mucosa thickens from the exposure to the androgen. 
And because the mucosa is thicker, the pitch drops more commonly into a low or gender neutral range or a high masculine range. And then if they become really lazy with their speech, like most men, and they don't vary the pitch at all, and they use a lot of statements, I'm right. Uh, <laughs> ah, we just went really down the stereotypical path. <laughs> <We're> just... <laughs> oh, you know, I'm just, you know, I, I, that's what I get told. No. Um, <laughs> so I think that uh, the vast majority of trans men don't report the same degree of vocal issues or communication issues that trans women. What are your thoughts? Can I just make sure I understand? So the question I think that you asked, Sarah, is if you had puberty blockers and then hormone therapy, there should be some nuances in voice because your larynx, vocal cords, cartilage never was exposed to those hormones. So it makes sense for a trans man, because then you are giving testosterone and we know it thickens it, but why is there more problems? I still guess I'm struggling with why there's still more problems with the trans woman's voice if they had blockers and hormone therapy earlier on in adolescence. I don't think there is going to be more problems. Not at all. And I think sometimes we, honestly, uh, children, adolescents transition early and are on hormone blockers and their first puberty is um, hormone induced, right? Like with HRT, then I don't think we're even seeing those kids because they have great response to therapy and they've have not lived 50 years. And maybe they were a trans woman the whole time where whatever, wherever they were in their realization and transition journey, um, they haven't had 50 years of socialization in a certain gender. Right. So I think there's so many things that are totally different. But we are we are saying for a trans man who has already gone through puberty and they're getting hormones later after puberty, their voice will get more masculine because the androgen exposure thickens the vocal cords. But it doesn't. The opposite is not true. Right. Correct. But also uh, Sarah hit, you know, a very important point there. That we are socialized to communicate in a style that is what the world sees us. So if the world sees us as a man and I use feminine speaking patterns, I'm going to get beat up, right? Well, hopefully not anymore. But anyway, I hear your point. Right. But I see that a lot in my older trans population. I was called names because my speaking patterns weren't right, right? And so that's hard for somebody who's 65. I can get the same pitch results with surgery, but they can't change the speaking patterns. Now, male speaking patterns are easier, I think, to adopt because they're not as dynamic in the speaking voice. And Sarah, please correct me if you disagree. They're not as dynamic. I mean, I'm staying on one pitch. I'm being monotone. I have one pattern. It's a statement and it falls at the end. But I think it depends on, you've had that pattern a long time. So I think it depends on the trans man's experience. It depends on their goals with their voice. And I think some people are more, it's easier for them to adopt that pattern. And as soon as they experience it, they're like, oh, they feel it. They connect with it. They're like, they feel affirmed with it and they're able to stick to it. And other people have more trouble. Like when they get excited, they revert to their old habits. Or when they're angry, they revert to their old habit. So I think there, there is, I can experience it. And then how do I practice and integrate and reset and find this moment of experience that was really affirming? How do I keep repeating it so that it becomes part of my everyday interaction? So when I'm mad, I don't think about it. I just do it, right? So it depends a little bit on the person. I understand what you're saying, Mark. I don't know if there's fewer variables. I think there's still the same variables that we're working on in different degrees with each person. So, and the trans men who have problems really are those who maintain the brightness, even though their pitch may descend. 
So they still have a very bright voice and it's perceived as higher than the 140 that it really is because it's so almost twangy. And when they get angry, now the good thing is when a, a cis woman gets angry, some of the pitch variability goes, right? And the loudness is masculine, nizing, right? Well, I think I just feel like people get angry in different ways. What I tend to explore it in the context of often when people get louder, more feminine communication is getting louder and higher pitched. Often more masculine communication is louder and lower. Like, go get your shoes on, right? Like that sort of thing versus go get your shoes on. Oh, but see, that's the that's the one that gets me. <laughs> Stereotypical. But I do both of those. By the 13th right. time I tell my child to get their shoes on, <laughs> I have... I've I've gone through all aspects of those. Right. So I think, right, like, and I say I do it because there's a, such a spectrum of what people expect when they get louder and what context they're in. And so when I used to get anxious as an ENT resident, my pitch would go up, my voice would start to strain. And one of my mentors, one of my favorite mentors said to me, Mark, I know when you're anxious or stressed because of your voice. And it's just like Sarah said, it can go up, right? And so it is a matter of teaching them to control it. And I, a lot of trans men can learn that on their own and some can't. And the ones who can't are the ones we see. The one thing I would add on that, Mark, is I think, I think that sometimes trans men are told that they will get the changes in their voice related to testosterone and so they're not always offered behavioral intervention, and some may be unaware of the access they have to behavioral intervention. I think we're getting better at that. I know where, where we are, we're better at that. But I don't know in other institutions or in places in the country if, if we, the royal we, are getting better at that. And so I think that also may be why we see fewer trans men. You know, that's a very important point, and it goes back to what we discussed earlier, you know, that, that people aren't aware of voice in part because the world doesn't think about voice as much. I always say every insurance person should get dysphonic for a couple of weeks a year. Just so they understand how important it is to be able to speak freely. I mean, I, I just, you know, World Voice Day, awareness about voice is very important. And you, Sarah, you raised this excellent point. They're told they should get a knock. Right. And so they don't seek care. And that's not an acceptable standard anymore. So let's let's talk about care. Um, let's talk about non-surgical management first. Tell me a little bit about are there dietary lifestyle modifications, some of the over sort of general. And then tell me a little bit about um, the role of speech pathology. From a dietary and lifestyle perspective, I think, you know, it depends if somebody has reflux, sort of those are things that can impact diet and li lifestyle sorts of things. The other thing is we want everybody, we want people to take care of their voices in general. So vocal hygiene, as in, you know, hydration, avoiding laryngeal irritants like smoking, because those are absolutely going to impact pitch and potentially resonance. So those types of vocal health sorts of things. When we're talking about behavioral intervention, often this is the first line of care. It is very person specific. Um, and this is, this is a little bit of a generalization, but often voice therapy or voice training is a first line of care. And it is because voice is so dynamic. Voice and communication are very dynamic. It is not just about pitch, as we've been exploring throughout the last hour. So we're really working on all of these variables to shift them to meet the person's needs. And when I present it to someone seeking care, I generally say, you know, our goals are twofold. You're leading these goals. We're aligning our goals together to make sure that we can get where you want to go. That's why you're here. But it's twofold. It's about you feeling affirmed internally and then also the external um, identification. Because sometimes one aspect of that is more important to some one person than it is to the other person. 
And when we can understand that, some people are like, I love my voice the way it is, but I want people to appropriately gender me. And so they're working on the external portion, which is more important to them. Other people are like, I don't want to be cis assumed, right? I'm fine with having uh, some masculine characteristics in my voice. In fact, I want to be able to access those. So it really is an exploration of goals and those variables, tweaking them to meet the person where they need to be. I thought that explanation is wonderful. And I forgot one thing I ask patients sometimes is, do you want the world to know your journey or do you want to be cis-assumed? I've never used that language, but in a gestalt way of thinking, and I need to look at this, I think a high percentage of trans women want to be cis-assumed. We call it a dead name, right? We use language that tries to deny that there was a problem with gender assigned at birth. And I, I think that developed because many transgender people do want to be cis-assumed. Really, though, today's world is open to transition. The world of the past wasn't. So that may change, but that's something we should look at specifically. And um, we should follow the trends in it. If I had a transgender child, I would help them be everything they wanted to be, right? But I just always assumed they would want to be cis-assumed but maybe they don't. That's a good, interesting point. I mean, because you always assume this assumed because you think of privacy, you think of this coming out. I think that's a very interesting point that, that you have and those options, um, those choices is something that our patients and our, our team should be able to think through and validate too if, if that option is chosen in there. Yes. And, and there are a lot of non-binary people that are seeking voice care and it may be, they're non-binary and want more masculine characteristics in their voice or vice versa. And if we go back to the beginning when we were talking about gray area, it's not, this is not binary. Um, there's a lot of gray area in a great way. In terms of um, speech pathology and like gender voice training, you know, is this like, okay, well, we're going to try this for six months or, you know, this could take years. How do you set expectations and um, counsel patients? And then how do you know when, hey, We've done a lot in this. We're not getting to where the patient wants to be. Totally. So um, these are conversations we're having every day. And with uh, sort of the way we've presented it is we often start with four sessions of voice therapy because we know that in, in other populations of voice, uh, that tends to be kind of the dropout rate. What we've um, observed over time is it does not, we know, does not take four sessions. Some people are done in four sessions. Most people are not. And we've actually looked back at about 100 people seeking gender-affirming voice care. And what we've learned is that the average number of sessions over the first year is about six. It ranges from one to 20 sessions in the first year with um, an average of about six. And then about 11% of those people are referred back to the physician to discuss some medical management in the form of probably likely surgery. And about 7% of those people end up having surgery. So this is a snapshot in time, and it's not meant to be the be-all, end-all. But the first thing we wanted to demonstrate is gender-affirming care takes more than four sessions, um, which is in our literature. And then that not, not all those people are going for surgery, right? So there are, some people are going to be discharged and some people are going to continue therapy. So we followed people over like a four-year period, and they're definitely the cohort of people that continue therapy on in that time frame. So that's sort of how we start to set expectations. And we say this is a personal decision that we'll, we will make together in the context of therapy based on how you're doing. Discharge, quote unquote, discharge criteria, whatever that sort of means, because we're always here if they need us. And I think is when the person has met their goals. And if we are reaching barriers to their goals, like it is difficult to maintain pitch without fatigue, they're able to achieve more forward focus an easier, more balanced voice, one that has more masculine or feminine characteristics. Often trans women are seeking surgery, so more feminine characteristics. 
then we're absolutely like, I think we've done the things we can do in therapy and you need more support with this and maybe surgery is the best option. And then they talk to the surgeon about their candidacy. And then we usually do some therapy postoperatively if that is the case. So I always tell patients, anytime you see a therapist of any type, whether it's occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychotherapy, speech therapy, you should leave that 30 to 60 minute session with a clear concept of one or two things that makes you feel better about your problem. And that's how you judge if that clinician, that therapist is a fit for you. So they give you something that makes you feel better about your voice or your style of communication, and you know how to try to generalize that into communication. It's not an exercise. The semi-occluded vocal tract therapies are not exercises. They promote sensations, and then the patient has to generalize that sensation and into connected speech, right? And that's what they're trying to do. So I start there. And then my colleagues in speech therapy do progress monitoring with the patient on a regular basis. And the follow-up visits that they have with me are to have an interdisciplinary progress monitoring, right? And Sarah, we had very similar numbers. I think the 3.75 that came from Hapner was really readiness to change. Completing that many therapy sessions doesn't say you're going to have changed. It says you're ready to change. Well, and those people dropped out of therapy. They didn't come back. (laughs) They didn't come back. So you're ready to change now. Now, how long it takes. What I don't like seeing is I get patients. Now, my practice is skewed because patients come to, to me and to us for surgery primarily. And I find myself talking a lot of patients out of surgery. But we're monitoring how well they're doing and then changing, giving them a different intervention if the initial one doesn't work. What I don't like seeing is somebody who's had 40 sessions over two years and is still complaining of, I see that, I see eight to 10 new transgender patients a week. And I see that probably about three, four times a month where they've been in therapy and you 20 to 40 sessions with somebody a year and they or more, and they've still been complaining of vocal fatigue, and they've been told they shouldn't have surgery, that surgery's no good, or they'll need to go to Korea or travel internationally. So that's the one thing I'm concerned about, right? Because value is really outcome over cost, right? Or the other way around. But, you know, you want to get the patients through as quickly as they can with their transition, Um, not rushing it. I totally agree with you that 40 sessions of therapy in two years is the absolute outlier. I don't think I've ever done that in my entire career. And we need to be really reflecting on what we're doing in that context. I would say we see about the same number of new patients a week, and that is much less frequent, but it's a different region of the U.S., which may impact that. And to Mark's point, I think this is where the value of having a voice specialized SLP in the context of gender affirming work is really key because hopefully um, there is this progress monitoring that's happening all the time throughout the process. So we're not getting to this point where the patient is struggling. I also think it takes a special patient to do 40 sessions in two years. Um, and not have a question about what's going on in the process and not asking, like, why am I not making more progress more quickly? And I think that's our job to really empower the patient to question us along the way if that's a problem. So uh, that's another thing that I think just making sure that we're empowering the patient to be like, hey, why have I had 40 sessions and I'm still not better? That is why why am I still not where I want to be? And It's different. You know, the Northeast is not, I've always been the Vanderbilt Voice Center or the UCSF Voice and Swallowing Center or the Grabside Voice and Swallowing Center. I've never personally promoted, but the Northeast in New York City is a city of individuals. They don't go to the Grabside. They go to a clinician at the Grabside based on reputation. So I think the Northeast has a special, and a lot of the people with reputations And transgender voice therapy care just sort of encouraged this sort of prolonged behavioral approach. Some, 
I don't know. I wouldn't say a lot. So, Mark, what then, you know, we know kind of doing the same thing and not getting the progress isn't helpful. When do you consider surgery? What makes a patient a good candidate? And how does that frame uh, thinking go? So a patient is a good candidate for surgery when they're vocally efficient, all right? When they're using minimal muscular effort for maximal sound output, they're using resonance and flow, and they can vary their pitch. And, you know, so they can demonstrate all those things, but if they forget, if they're not mindful, it drops into an unacceptable pattern of speaking. When they reflexively yell, they become masculine sounding. When they try to get loud, they become masculine sounding. So those are all good candidates for surgery. Some patients come in that way. You know, I have been exploring my journey for a year or two. I've not done much. And you listen to them and you see their stimulability for change and producing efficient voice and they can do it. And then they're a candidate for surgery. And then there are some women who are so pitch obsessed that they can't do any of those pragmatic and prosody changes because they're so worried about elevating their pitch. Now, they are not the best candidates for surgery. And the absolute worst candidate for surgery is someone who comes in with a strain pattern used to decrease volume and elevate pitch at the same time. And those are the hyperfunctional underclosures patients. They still get better with surgery. It elevates their pitch some, but it doesn't alter their fatigue. So they're very depressed because of that. And they still can't get into falsetto or really high pitch voice production. And they have problems with volume because I've taken a larger larynx which can get loud by any mechanism, as Sarah demonstrated so beautifully for us. And I've made it a smaller larynx, and so now they have problems with intensity, with volume. You know, so when, it depends on the patient. But the characteristics that I'm looking for are essentially vocal efficiency and being able to separate the subsystems of speech. So I want them to move the tongue separately from the articulators, the lips, and separately from the larynx, the vibrator. Uh, when we think about feminization, laryngoplasty, and masculinization, laryngoplasty, what exactly, how do you explain that to patients? What's happening? So it's a physiologic change in the mass or tension of the vocal folds, right? Because frequency of vibration is proportional to tension over mass. As mass, as tension goes up, pitch goes up. As mass goes up, pitch goes down. So for feminization laryngoplasty, the world is starting to favor, the community is starting to favor endoscopic approaches. And Dr. Wendler was one of the people who originally described a technique, but I, nobody does exactly what Dr. Wendler described, or very few people do it. So, you know, for ease, I call it a modified Wendler but realistically, I'm shifting to call it endoscopic vocal fold shortening or tensing procedures because I think that what I'm doing is both shortening the vocal folds and tensing them um, by the way I place the sutures to elevate pitch. In terms of surgery to lower pitch, can't really increase the mass too much. So I decrease their ability to create tension but then you lose closure. And if you go for too much, they have a breathier, softer voice. And so that's problematic. So then you end up doing a medialization afterwards in, I don't know a percentage, in a large number of those patients to give them back some volume. But you have to be careful that you don't make them strained or pressed and then have a perception of a higher pitch again. So... I can't get more than a 20 dp drop with vocal fold tension reduction procedures, a type 3 thyroplasty, before I get too much breathiness in my patient. I do it about six times a year, as opposed to an average of three a week times 40 weeks, as opposed to 120 times for on um, pitch elevation surgery. 
For the pitch lowering surgery, you'd mentioned the breathy voice and medialization. Is that something you do at the time of surgery? You go ahead and correct that? Or do you wait post-op and that's something that you may have to go back for? I wait and do it as a separate stage. Not everybody needs it. It's not more than 50%. And it's awful and complicated. I, I do an anterior commissure pushback. And so now I've done this dissection and I don't know how to get the implants to stay in place. And so I don't want to do too much at once. I know there are some people, I, I think there are some people who do it together, but I just haven't learned that technique or adopted it yet. And are these surgeries under general anesthesia? Is the patient, you know, when we think of thyroplasty, like are they kind of can still talk to you and you're having them perform Tell us about that. So I do it like a standard approach for type 1 thyroplasty. I slip a flexible telescope in the nose. I mount it to a video camera and internally visualize the larynx throughout the entire case. And I make my incisions and I push the anterior commissure back and I tilt it. I find that I usually push the inferior portion in more than the superior portion and it seems to lower pitch without as much reduction in volume. And uh, in terms of sutures, do you have like a suture preference for the surgery for either the pitch lowering or elevation? So for the pitch lowering surgery, I use prolines, 2-0 and 4-0 to hold the segment in place. For the pitch elevation, I'm doing it endoscopically. I use absorbable vicrals. Uh, four ovicals. Some surgeons, I think Dr. Kim at the Yesen Clinic uses, I know he uses proline, four o proline, and leaves it in there. You know, if I you do a tracheal section and you, a proline is exposed, it's usually not a problem. And often over time, it'll be epithelialized over the top. But that's just my preference. I like the absorbable sutures and I've not had a problem with it. In terms of um, anesthesia, you know, is there any sort of special, hey, I, I need to make sure I let anesthesia know anything specific when you take these patients to the surgery? And are there any special preoperative things that the patient has to do? Can they continue their hormone therapy throughout or any concerns with some of the periop? So that's been a continuing hormone therapy before surgery has been a thing for the, the vaginal surgeons, for the urological surgeons, you know. But I think it's pretty much established now that they don't need to stop their hormone therapy, all right? And um, I use the laser to create my chordectomy defects. And so I have a 5-5 five, five laser safe endotracheal tube placed at the start of the case. And then if they're going to have surgery after, I tell them, you always need to tell your anesthesiologist for future surgeries. First of all, I don't let them have surgery for three months afterwards because I have had patients where the web was stretched open. All right. So I, I tell them you can't be intubated for three months and I hope I get two. Right. And then I say, when you're intubated, you have to tell the anesthesiologist that they need to have a grade one view. They have to see the entire larynx before they slip the tube in and they should use a 6-0 tube. And then in terms of uh, surgery, Repair of the framework, how is that different? Is that the same as the, quote, tracheal shave? What is repair of the framework? Or is that the same as the endoscopic thyroplasties we were discussing? So there's a couple of different procedures. We can reduce the Adam's apple, and that is typically called a tracheal shave, but it's the thyroid cartilage. So the Adam's apple, the thyroid cartilage is not the trachea. And I have seen one patient where they shaved the cricoid ring in the front of the trachea. And I know. So I don't like that term tracheal shave because it doesn't represent. I don't like laryngochondroplasty either because it's plasty, right? And this is not elective. For a woman with a very prominent Adam's apple, it's a very masculinizing feature. It's not elective. So I don't like the term plasty. So I just call it what we're doing. Thyroid cartilage reduction, TCR. So that's where I sit. Now, in the Anterior commissure retrusion is basically a type 3 ischiki thyroplasty. And that is not really a repair. That's a alteration of the shape of the laryngeal framework so that they can't get as much tension. 
So the TCR is not just cosmetic then? Does it also play a role in the function too? No, it, it's just cosmetic. I mean, I don't have a very prominent Adam's apple with my wrinkles in particular, but I'm taking the top centimeter to a centimeter half and a half off of the cartilage to eliminate the V or notching. And then I'm rounding the outer table. And I slip a needle in. So I do that with an LA in place and I slip a needle in from the outside. So I know the level of the vocal folds and I can remove everything. I do it with a three centimeter incision over the hyoid bone. I, I haven't done it. I've observed somebody doing it uh, through a sublabial approach, right? So the Greek word for neck is lamos. So it would be lamoscopy as opposed to laparoscopy, right? Lamoscopy. Not a, an appealing term, but uh, through a laparoscopic approach, but it takes six hours. And I have the impression you can't get as much off that way. I have very few complications with the scar. So, you know, I haven't done my own and I'm debating whether or not I ever will. In terms of possible complications from these types of surgeries, um, how do you counsel patients? So the complications from pitch lowering surgery is loss of volume. And I tell them, you know, you might need a second stage to increase the volume. It may or may not help. And infection doesn't happen. I haven't had infection. I haven't had airway compromise. With the pitch elevation surgeries, the endoscopic pitch elevation surgeries, the complications are loss of volume, roughness, and, you know, just not the pitch elevation you want. And so my revision rate is about 2%, and it's usually because of a small adynamic segment and a closure defect. And so... um I basically make the web a little longer and suture that together in those women, and it's worked well. Or I've done bilateral medialization, and it has worked well in those women to get more volume. The most common reason for loss of volume is that the patient is still not using uh, stretch and flow techniques to produce voice. They're still using a hyperfunctional underclosure technique, and they just can't get as loud as they need. And I have one lady who I saw on Wednesday and she was a bad surgical candidate because she couldn't get rid of that hyperfunctional underclosure strain pattern. And I, I document that in the preoperative chart. And so three months post-op, she doesn't have the volume she wants and she still has vocal fatigue. And I said, well, I, I indicated that this could likely happen and I can get her into resonance and flow on vowels. Her pitch goes up. Her Loudness level goes up, but she can't generalize that into speech. I don't know why. For loss of volume, do you ever just do like injectable fillers to see if that helps? And then you decide if you're going to do something more permanent. Is that how you would go about this? That's how I go about it. I usually just inject Juvederm bilaterally in the office. It takes about 20 minutes. The patient has a change in quality of their voice. They're closing better, so their harmonic spectrum is stronger. They have more to present to the vocal tract. It's louder. And if they have a large adynamic segment, though, because there's a granuloma that formed during healing, then I'll usually just extend that web. In your immediate post-op, um, you said in the beginning, this is usually day surgery. Any role for like x-rays, antibiotics, anything like that? And then do you, part of your recovery protocol, is there any voice rest, dietary modifications? So when I cut the mucosa, I place them on six days of voice rest to let things stabilize and heal. I talk to the patients about laryngeal tension because a lot of patients with laryngeal hypersensitivity, neurogenic laryngeal hypersensitivity, irritable larynx, will be... <laughs> even if they're not making noise. And I think that tears the sutures out. It increases edema. And then a certain percentage of them come back just functionally aphonic. They're so consumed about their voice that they're afraid to speak. So, you know, we spend the first post-op visit getting them to produce voice. 
unless they're too swollen, and then maybe two or three percent need an extra week of voice rest. It's just to let the swelling go down. And I talk to them about really not clearing their throat silently, not straining, not bearing down. And I talk about all of this pre-op. And so then, you know, then usually by two, three weeks, they're back to at least 50% of conversational voice use. And, and by two months, they're pretty good. By three months, they're where they're going to be. Uh, for the pitch reduction surgeries, I don't put them on voice rest because I haven't cut the mucosa. For the thyroid cartilage reduction, I tell them they're going to be swollen, they might be bruised, but they don't need voice rest. And um, in terms of post-op speech therapy, when does that start to come into play? And then uh, if Sarah could kind of also answer how different that is from pre-op speech therapy. So our patients need an average of two sessions post-op. But then you have the hyperfunctional underclosure lady who is still complaining of not being able to produce sufficient voice and having fatigue, but she won't come for more than three sessions. But then you have those who go on for six or eight sessions. Yeah, I would say in our post-op protocol, um, we're generally um, doing about three post-operative voice therapy sessions, maybe four. That first week when they're coming off a of voice rest, we start some voice exercises, that sort of thing. It's kind of just a jumping off point, and then we'll have three additional sessions to that. So the way therapy is structured is quite similar to what I would say we're focusing on if we're just, just doing voice therapy perspective. The differences are that the person is healing, so they may have some varying levels of fatigue. They may have some stiffness or swelling postoperatively. So we're expecting the quality output and the way they feel when they make their voice might be a little bit different. So we're adjusting to those so they're not pushing through, so they're not guarding and maybe using a hyperfunctional underclosure sort of pattern because they want everything to go right and they're trying hard. You know, so we tr we're trying to navigate um, how each person responds and then coaching them in, in a way that is going to help them have the most efficiency with the way they are healing. We progress monitor in an interdisciplinary team mode at one week, one month, two months, three months for our patients. We don't consider that individual therapy, right? Even though the SLP is adjusting parameters of voice production, it's less than 20 minutes with the patient. But then patients come back an average of two times in addition to those visits for uh, individual 30-minute or 45-minute therapy sessions. That's the same. Same for us. Well, I just want to thank you both so much for your time, especially sharing your experience. As we wrap it up, any final pearls about gender-affirming voice or any final thoughts on how uh, we as otolaryngologists and, and healthcare providers in the field of medicine can provide more equitable care for these patients and their families? From the voice perspective, and honestly, holistically, I think my goal, and I think our goal, if I can speak for us a little bit, is that we, we really want to meet each person where they are so that we understand what their goals are, we understand their needs and their potentially their support system, all of these factors that are going to impact their uh, voice care. And then keeping a broader view of, like you asked about equitable care. I mean, I think outreach in our communities, awareness with our institutions on insurance, on cash pay options, on all of these which may be limiting as well, but being mindful of what is going to create the most access for the most people seeking care really are important factors that we have to keep in mind as we do this work so that we are reaching as many people as possible. Sarah, I second your comments. And I think we need to do education amongst our colleagues, you know, our colleagues in otolaryngology and our colleagues in in medicine and endocrinology so that they understand what is available today for trans patients. Um, because voice, as I've said, is overlooked usually. On that point, a textbook we wrote, I, you contributed to it, Sarah, is hopefully going to be published by the October, by the fall voice meeting, finally. 
And it, it um, you know, it has the beginning session on basics in endocrinology, in terminology, in medical care for trans patients. And then it goes through different surgical and behavioral techniques. I should have said behavioral and surgical techniques. So I hope people can use it as a primer. I think that it'll allow the endocrinologist to see what's out there or the primary care physician. And then the other thing is surgery with precision does help patients. And we need not be afraid of it or think of it as a bad thing or a failure when we do it. I think what we really need is precision. And when I look at TWVQ changes, trans women voice questionnaire changes, they're greatest in the patients who've had both therapy and surgery than for the patients who've had only surgery or the patients who've had only therapy. So I think from an patient outcomes, you know, it's important. And, and if we look at the TWVQ, when the patient comes in, the first one they fill out, if they've got a lot of psychosocial reporting issues on the questionnaire, they generally don't go for surgery. If they have a lot of physical issues, they generally go for surgery. So it's not just that the questionnaire is uh, more scaled to the negative aspect. It's the, the types of questions and the way they rate those physical qualities of voice. Which, Mark, what you're saying really highlights the value of this interdisciplinary care model. And not everybody has access to it. Not all speech pathologists, not all physicians have access to this interdisciplinary care model. But it speaks to education, reaching out in our community for common referral patterns, reaching out to the community gender centers, all of this to to really like create community um, among each other so that even if we can't be in the same room at the same time, that we can be having these discussions in conjunction with the patient to optimize their care. Yeah. As you said earlier, voice is so behavioral that except for cancer or papilloma, I would never do surgery on somebody for voice without seeing if they can adjust their behaviors to negate the need for surgery first. And I know a colleague in New York said, ah, send them to grab shy. They'll just send them for therapy. And I chuckled, but I was kind of happy that I had that reputation. And it's not just sending somebody for therapy. It's, it's teaching the patient to be happy with what they have rather than automatically wishing for and demanding something different, right? So, um, and to use what they have with the most efficiency and respect. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate, again, all your vast experience, expertise, the discussion amongst you guys. For our listeners that have any further questions or would want to reach out to you, um, are you guys on any social media? And if so, you can tell us or we can put it in the show notes if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, social media, I'm happy to send the handles to you. Also, email is totally fine, too, for me. So... It's on the GrabShide uh, website. And then we have a GrabShide Instagram account. But reaching out through in- Instagram, I don't know how HIPAA compliant it is. And it's probably best that they leave a message with the office and we'll get back to them. If somebody wants to talk with me, email mark.cory at mountsigning.org. You know, is a way they can reach me and I'll do my best to answer. Right. That sounds great. Um, thank you for our listeners for tuning in and stopping by. I think it's a wrap. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ogrodzinski. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. 
Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.